Good afternoon and welcome to Learn at Home with BIA. My name is Daniel Wolfsleigel and I am a sixth grade math and science teacher at Lycoming Valley Intermediate School in Williamsport School District. You know, even though most of us are home right now, we're trying to spend a little time outside. The weather's getting nice, the plants and insects are coming back, and I've seen a lot of birds returning from their winter trips. This got me thinking, so how do birds know where to travel? They don't use GPS like most of us would. Well, let's dig a little deeper and find out how do birds navigate? Now, before we get started today, there's a little bit of vocabulary we need to be on the lookout for. First is the word migration, the process of traveling to a different place. Second, magnetosensation, the ability of animals to detect the Earth's magnetic field. Sun compass, something that uses the sun to determine direction. Lines of force, the attracting or pushing charges between a magnet and electrons. And genetic information, information passed on from one generation to the next. So let's talk about that word migration. So that's really just a movement from one place to another. But because birds aren't always adapted or prepared for every season, many species have been known to move from place to place. Now this is usually either to follow food, like insects that aren't available in the wintertime, or sometimes it's for returning to very specific breeding grounds. So other species though, have been known as partial migrants, sort of like the American robin. And these species, some members stay and other members migrate, and we're not really sure who decides which is gonna do which. So how exactly do birds migrate? Well, at my school every spring, we have a lot of these. Now they don't hang around long, they're really just passing through from one place to another, but when birds migrate, they can travel large distances depending on the different species. Now, that average migratory distance can be between 1,000 and 3,000 kilometers. That's about 16 to 1,800 miles. But it's not uncommon for some species to travel as far as 4,000 miles in their journey. I mean, that's exhausting. But a migratory journey isn't usually done in one night. It's, it's oftentimes broken up into a series of short flights. So some birds, like songbirds, migrate at night and others, you know, fly during the day. So how are animals able to find their, their way over such long distances? Well, some people have the idea that they'll be able to track the sun. Well, of course, that doesn't work when it's cloudy. And you may already know that some animals rely on a keen sense of smell to be able to find where they're going. They can track other members of their group, or they can even leave scents for members coming behind them. But when you're traveling, hundreds if not thousands of kilometers a year, it's very unlikely that you're going to be using scent to be able to find your way. So we've been looking at evidence of what other things that they're able to do. Are they able to track from the stars if they're flying at night? Are they able to track using landmarks? Maybe even Earth's magnetic field. Homing pigeons were famous for being able to navigate extremely long distances. So their homing ability was so reliable that during World War I and World War II, soldiers were able to deliver messages over enemy lines, over really great distances, because these birds had such an ability to find their way. So, do they carry a map? Do they use a compass? The answer might surprise you. So take a second and form your own ideas. How do you think birds find their way? So let's look at a pattern of actual migration. This is the migratory pattern of adult snow geese in the Western Arctic in 2018. Each of those lines represents a flock of geese making its way down south. You can see that come December, they're resting safely in their summer home. Now that we fast forward a couple months, you can see them slowly making their way back north again, following almost the exact same trails that they made their way south. So what is this pattern of migration for them and how are they able to navigate without any maps or compass or really any guidelines? Now, about 50 animal species ranging from birds and mammals to reptiles and insects use Earth's magnetic field for navigation. 
yet Earth's magnetic field, it's very, very weak. We obviously don't see it, we don't feel it. It can go approximately 30 to 60 millionths of one Tesla, which is a unit of measurement. Now, by comparison, that may not mean a lot to you, but an MRI machine you might see at a hospital could use between 1.5 and 3 Tesla. That's like 50,000 times more. There is research that shows there's something called a photochemical compass, which is really just a, a very fancy way of saying these chemicals that receive light in the brain and show us which direction we're going, uh, can show how migrating birds use the magnetic field along with light to help navigate. One theory is that these receptors in a bird's eye absorb light, which causes a chemical reaction, and they'll literally show the direction and the magnitude of Earth's magnetic field, very much like the compass on your phone. Now, this comes from the fact that blue light receptors have been found in the eyes of migratory birds, and in 2008, a study published by the National Science Foundation was able to show that these chemicals become sensitive to the magnitude and direction of magnetic fields similar to Earth's. So what exactly is a compass? A compass is any instrument that's used for navigation and orientation that shows us our direction, usually north, south, east, and west. Most people only know the compass that's built into their phone, or maybe they have one in a GPS in their car. Most original compasses used a polarized needle to be able to show which way was north. Now, how a magnet works is a magnetic compass needle lines itself up with Earth's magnetic field, and it points roughly north to south. So if you figure out north and south, you can figure out east and west, too. And because this works pretty well, people have been using magnetic compasses for well over a thousand years. Earth's magnetic field is a result of the movement of liquid iron in the outer core. So in the center, it's so hot that there is actually liquid metal. Now, as it moves, it generates an electric current, and that leads to a magnetic field. So that continual movement of liquid metal through that magnetic field creates stronger electrical currents and, therefore, a stronger magnetic field. Okay, so what's the big idea here? Really, what we're trying to say is that the movement of liquid metal in the core of Earth creates its magnetic field. Okay, so here's an experiment that you can do at home to test out Earth's magnetic pole. Uh, I have a couple things that I might have laying around the house here. So number one is a pack of needles, and the other one would be a thread. So if I don't have a compass laying around that I could use, I can still find north and south. Now we're in the northern hemisphere. So what I really need to do is find something that's going to pull on that magnetic piece of Earth's polarity. And for that I have... A kitchen magnet just a regular old magnet here so I'm gonna take a needle out of my pack here and I take my needle and I know it's kind of difficult to see so I'll make sure that I put a piece in here for you can see and let's get ourselves a piece of thread and I take the needle and the thread and I'm gonna tie the thread around the needle Okay, so now that I have my needle, and I'm going to wrap my thread around it and tie it off. And that is going to let it hang right there. Okay, so my next piece, I want to go ahead and grab my magnet. Take my magnet, and I take my, my needle here. And I realize that I want to polarize only one part of that magnet, and that's going to actually be pulled towards magnetic north. So I'm going to take my magnet and I'm going to magnetize one part of my needle. And just by bringing it in contact, um, this will change the magnetic, what's called polarity, of this needle. All right, so I have taken this kitchen magnet and I have my, key, my string and my needle here. So when I dangle it, it should line up north and south. And there you go.
it is lined up north and south. Pretty cool. And now we take a little break with random, random trivia. trivia. Shake off the nerves and get the blood pumping to your brain. Grab a friend because it's time to go. So I have an absurd love of random trivia. My students will happily tell you that. I'm one of those people that loves those little bits of information that make people kind of stop and go, why do you even know that? Well, I find the world a really interesting place. Plus, it really comes in handy at times like this. So without further ado, here we go. Your question today is which of these is the fastest flying bird? Do you have a thought? Hmm. So if we were talking about the fastest flying bird, our first choice could be the hummingbird, B, the American woodcock, C, the peregrine falcon, D, the golden eagle, or E, the African ostrich. Go ahead, take your time. Have an answer? Care to make at least a guess? Let's see what we came up with. First up, we have the African ostrich. Now these are very, very impressive birds, but unfortunately, they don't fly. They are, however, amazing sprinters. The African ostrich is the fastest land bird. It can run at an incredible 43 miles an hour. It can even trot at 31 miles an hour for miles and miles and never grow tired. You definitely don't want to outrun one of these birds. So the ostrich is out. Let's see what's next. The American hummingbird. Now, these are some of the world's smallest migrating birds, and in fact, the bee hummingbird is the world's smallest bird. With an average heart rate of more than 1,200 beats per minute, it's really no surprise that they only live two to five years. Now, while they may have some of the fastest wings, and they may have the fastest heartbeat, they're definitely not the fastest flying bird. Sorry, hummingbird, you're out. All right, so the hummingbird and the ostrich are out. So let's see what's next. Ah the American woodcock. Now, the American woodcock is definitely not the fastest flying bird, though it may be some of the funniest looking. The American woodcock is the slowest bird that flies in North America. It only flies at five miles per hour. It's actually the slowest flying bird in the entire world. While it's a very popular game bird, there are over 550,000 killed every year in the United States. Their population is sadly on the decline, mainly due to loss of habitat. American woodcock, you're not the fastest. Up next, the golden eagle. Now this is a seriously intimidating bird. While it is one of the most well-known birds of prey in the Northern Hemisphere, it's not quite as recognizable as its bald eagle cousin. Now it does have a very long life. It can live 38 years in the wild and up to 50 years in captivity. It's got a huge wingspan. It can go up to seven and a half feet. Now, it does fly at an astounding 150 miles per hour, but it's still not the fastest. Sorry, Eagle, even though you are seriously cool. Well, we've eliminated everybody else, so the obvious choice here is the Peregrine Falcon. While the Peregrine Falcon may not look as intimidating as the Golden Eagle, it is the most perfect predator. It has been clocked at speeds over 186 miles per hour. 186 miles per hour. It is so fast, it has to have special flaps adapted in its nose so that its lungs don't explode when it's diving. When it comes down to hit its prey, it doesn't actually attack them so much as kill them instantly by striking them. At speeds like that, it's absolutely no contest who the fastest flying bird is, the peregrine falcon. And now, you know. Let's get back to the show. So if a bird returns to the same site each year, it has to have some sort of genetically based ability to remember the site and how to get there. So for example, a young warbler may carry genetic information that causes it to remember its place of birth and then respond to cues to guide it all the way to its migration in Puerto Rico. The young bird spends the winter moving around looking for a good place to stay. And then when it's done in the winter, it goes all the way back. So some birds may spend their entire life in only a few acres, but two places hundreds or thousands of miles apart. 
We see this in other things too. One thing that comes to mind is the monarch butterfly. Now they instinctively know where to go every year, even though they've never been there before. That's crazy. So there has to be some kind of a genetic basis to their migration because even young birds that have never migrated before can successfully find their breeding grounds without any help. And you might think, well, that's easy enough. They just follow the other birds who have been there before. But in many shorebirds, the adults leave for their wintering grounds before the young. So the young would have to know where to go without any help. So what does all of this tell us? It means that some birds can be born with information already embedded into their DNA. Now, birds don't just navigate one way. Beyond their ability to detect the energy of magnetic fields, they have proteins in their eyes that allow them to visualize magnetic fields. The proteins single out strands of magnetism within their surroundings and convert them into a visible compass, kind of like looking at your GPS. So what's the big idea? Really what we're trying to say is that some birds can actually see directions through Earth's magnetic field. Now there is some indication that birds can sometimes use landmarks. So remember those homing pigeons? Well, in one experiment, a group of them were taken 200 miles off the coast of France into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Only 2% were able to return home. They didn't have any land to guide them. But in other studies, pigeons were given special eye covers so they could see light but nothing else. And most actually found their way home. So now we know. Some birds use landmarks like mountains to find their way. The position of the sun has been a guide of some kind for almost all creatures at one point or another. In one experiment, a group of birds called starlings were put in cages with dark walls and a see-through top. And on sunny days, they directed themselves with no problem. But on cloudy days, they just stood around randomly. The sun moves across the sky at different points of the year, so you'd have to be able to track its movement with the seasons, which birds seem to be able to do by setting their internal biological clocks. Now, while I can't even get up with my own alarm clock, one experiment with homing pigeons kept pigeons under artificial light until their biological clock was six hours off from the actual daytime. When released, they flew 90 degrees off in the wrong direction. So one-fourth of a day, one-fourth of a compass off in direction. This internal clock is called a sun compass. What this tells us is that when there's no land to see landmarks, birds can use the sun. The final way we're going to discuss that birds can orient themselves is something called geomagnetism. Essentially, we've talked a lot about magnets and how they work in relationship to Earth. Well, birds seem to have the ability to orient using one of the most controversial and possibly least understood navigational methods. Early studies into navigation with the Earth's magnetic pool put birds into large cement cages with no clues at all as to where they were. The birds were able to orient properly to north and south. But when they were put in a large steel cage, well, they oriented randomly. This is probably because steel interferes with magnets. Oh, uh, what? Okay, so we've already talked about how the electromagnetic field in Earth comes from the center. And it comes out of the top and the bottom and it sort of creates this nice bubble around Earth. Well, what happens is it's built on these electrons. So electrons spinning around there trying to interact were stopped because metal conducts electricity really well. So the electrons just ran along the metal instead of getting all the way through to the birds. If you want to see what this looks like, this is a picture taken of a magnet using iron fillings. And you can actually see the lines coming off of the positive and negative or north and south. These are called the lines of force, but a better name, I think, would be a force field. Remember those homing pigeons? 
where researchers have discovered a small spot in the beak of the pigeon and some other birds that contain a thing called magnetite. Now, magnetite is a magnetized rock which may act as a tiny GPS unit for the homing pigeon. It gives it information about its position relative to Earth's poles. So researchers have also found some specialized cells in birds' eyes that may help them see magnetic fields. Now, it's thought that birds can use both the beak magnetite and the eye sensors to travel long distances over areas that don't have a lot of landmarks and things like that, like even the ocean. In humans, deposits of magnetite have been found in the bones in our noses. Is it possible that at one point we used Earth's magnetic field to know which way we were going? What this really tells us is that it's believed that birds have adapted to be sensitive to the magnetic pull of Earth. It's also possible that humans were once able to sense it as well. Now, I don't have a fancy lab, but I like to study things too. So one cool experiment that you can do at home, they make these window bird feeders. So you take a little bird seed and you put it in here and attach it to your window. Then when you're inside, the bird lands here, you can watch them safely. Now, let's take a second and see what you remember. Which of these are things that birds use to determine direction? Take a moment and read them carefully. Do you have your answer? Let's see if you're right. If you said these four things, you're absolutely correct. The sun, geomagnetism, landmarks, and information that they're born with called genetic information are all ways that birds can determine their direction. So oftentimes I'm asked when I do a lesson, why is it that I actually have to care about this stuff? I mean, it's pretty complex, but it doesn't really change my day-to-day -day life. Well, in fact, modern society is causing a lot of problems for different animals. Power lines and other communication equipment can generate weak magnetic fields, and they can disrupt animal navigation. So it's really important that humans understand how animals navigate using Earth's weak magnetic field and then we start to understand the effects we're having on the environment and what we could be doing to help. So now we know the answer. Birds, like so many other species, have some pretty incredible adaptations. Now, get out and enjoy the day today and maybe discover something new. Thank you for joining me on Learn at Home with VIA.